Mr. George K joins us now. Thank you for coming on this morning. Well, from all so indications, it, it looks as if, I mean, no matter kind of speech a president, anyone at like that gives in this country, you always are happy people who say, ah, it remains to be seen. We need to feel something. Is that the case? Well, you see, I consider speeches on Independence Day as ceremonial, ritual. Oh. As a matter of fact, it is expected to make a speech. Even during a bachelor's period, he makes speeches. But they're supposed to be hinged on the goings on. Beautiful. So that's the only way you can situate a president's speech. I, without sounding unduly pessimistic, I didn't see any earth breaking news in that, in, in that, in that speech. Did you expect it? I didn't. You, I, well, one would have just thought that some kind of a rollout plan will, will be in place by which we'll, we can begin to uh, expect or at least analyze that these are milestones that we are supposed to achieve at this particular point in time and these are things to expect. But they were, it was like a, a scorecard and everything tried to center around electricity and all of that. But you see, I want us to deepen this discussion and go beyond the president's speech and situate it against the backdrop of Nigeria itself. Because I mean, like I told you, there are going to be speeches. Even when other presidents come, speeches were. And it will look like looking, I mean, the speech will just be a veneer of the development issues of Nigeria. So we go beyond the veneer, look, go beyond the cosmetics, and begin to see the, 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 the fundamental question we can ask at Nigeria. I mean, uh, Nigeria celebrating its 52, uh, 52nd uh, anniversary of independence is. Do we have a better Nigeria? Or, so look, at the litmus test is this. Are we handing over a better Nigeria to our children than the one that was bequeathed to us? And we appear to us all, all, all have the answer. The answer is what everybody keeps talking about, the old good days. The old good days. And in a country where you keep talking about the old good days, in other words, it suggests that yesterday is better than today. <laughs> and if yesterday is better than today, we're in trouble. Does it depend on who says it? No, you don't. The reality will dawn on your on your face. It will stare. It will stare you in the face. The reality is right there. Look at the reality, for instance. Let's look at. Let's for the first time talk about our children. We keep talking about the leaders of tomorrow, and we don't appear to bother about them. It will sound almost like a fiction to a new a young boy who is going who is even in the university today. To hear that, that same university that he, he is in, when people like us were in the university, those, those of us that went to university in the 70s, late 70s and early 80s, a, a regular university hostel was like a three-star hotel. That was what it was. And feeding was so, in short, some people went to the university to eat good food. Well, you see, quite a number of people who are in universities today do not even think that that was possible that happened in Nigeria. When you were in your final year, the chevrons of this then used to be golf. You know, UAC, Lever Brothers and all. They, in short, final year students, the way they greet themselves is that, who has recruited you? Who are you <laughs> joining? You know, they come to the university to recruit the, the final year students. In short, some people have what psychologists call approach-approach situation, where a mobile recruits you and promises you a car. Chevron recruits you and say, look, they want to send you abroad. Wetting, you have you're to. Wetting, you're wetting people's appetite. You, can, you can, have. You can have those to. Those days. You are having the, headache. Out can of, we get back to those days? Beautiful. Okay. That's what I'm. So, so when we keep talking about the president's speech, it, it's like a veneer of, of of the whole issue. Let's now deepen it. Situate it against the backdrop of where does Nigeria go to from here? How is it that we can just? What legacy are we leaving as a people? So when you now do that, you begin to look at. Maybe all this story about you no, know, we have we are having problems because Nigeria uh, was amalgamated in 1914. You know we are lamenting our past and all of that. And I have always said that any country is either a product of annexation, conquest, uh, merger, or amalgamation. Anywhere, you, anyone you find yourself in, you move forward. Don't continue to lament. At a particular point in time, we stopped you know, talking about the, the 1914 amalgamation. When I said it was military regime, if you ask me, even though everybody craves for democracy, the military people did more projects in this country 
than we, the politicians, are doing now. Quite a lot of the facilities that we are using today, call, call it airports, dual expressways, bridges, and all of that, we're all done by the military. So what is the problem? Leadership. Leadership. And I will come to that. My recommendation, let me go, go, go to my recommendation, because before long now you will stop me, is <laughs> my recommendation is that let us begin to work on our electoral process, reform of the electoral process, so that you can begin to throw up good leadership. We are talking about committed leaders. Because the difference between this scenario I have painted with the old good past and today that we are looking for reasons why we are not performing well. At a particular point in time, we say it is amalgamation. The other time, we say it is military regime and all that. It's because we had committed leaders at that point in time. If you go to Kano today, you cannot see anywhere they will say, this is Amin Kano estate. He didn't acquire any estate. He didn't leave any for anybody. Ditto for Zeke. The same thing for Awolowo. All of those people. But what is it today? Is that everybody, look at the privatization that just took place. If not that they made a mistake of trying to make it transparent, we wouldn't have known that literally everybody, and all the past leaders were all involved in the privatization. I mean, in this uh, electricity uh, uh, deal. Apart from Gowan that is busy praying for Nigeria. The rest of them <coughs> were all interested in one way or the other in buying up, you know. And I will tell you what happened those days that they decided to sell all the buildings in the GRA, the places that all, I mean, the past leaders lived in. A particular president came and sold all of it. You, you, you see, know. part of why I am painting this scenario is that we need to begin to train and groom leaders that are selfless, that are committed to the project Nigeria. As against those who are on one side talking about how do we divide the country so that some people can begin to govern themselves and we have even over-advertised and dramatized this issue of federalism. You talk about federalism, these are states that hardly can sustain themselves, that can hardly survive on their own and they are coming to uh, federalism. With what? You know that they are all feeding bottle, you know, states. They all go to Abuja to go and get sustenance. And they are talking about how they can sustain themselves. Something occurred to me when you were talking about the good old days and the pictures that, you know, people paint or that comes to mind when older people are talking and, you know, maybe younger people are listening. The, the question I want to ask is, do you think we can actually get back there? Assuming we actually do put in all our efforts and we work, because... I think it might not just be Nigeria where people talk about the good old days. I mean, is it not a worldwide phenomenon? We're talking about climate change now. People say it's a worldwide phenomenon and it's, not, it's nothing peculiar to us. You think that this good old days syndrome, as it were, is a, is a worldwide thing too and it's not peculiar No, it's not Nigeria. a global thing. You know, if you're talking about climate change, I mean, those are things that are natural. I mean, mm. there's nothing you can do about them. Mm. You know, you have to cope and deal with such situations mm. when they arise. What about values? You know? But you see, we are talking about good. That's the point I wanted to make. Values. A situation where somebody works hard and works home with a good pension and just goes home and relaxes with a good pension. Now, we are talking about a situation where you create your pension while you are working, in which case you acquire what you don't even need. Such that you, even the children you are acquiring it for do, may not even need it. Class materialism. Is, is erosion of values so, so a peculiarly Nigerian problem? It is worse with Nigeria. It is worse with Nigeria because over the years, you have found out that our values have changed from hard work, those uh, the, the, having to value you know, the, the good things that make life move, to worshipping wealth, worshipping material. And... Even, even the churches themselves worship materials such that if it's the rich that stays in the front pew and all of that, those who sustain the church, you get the point? So it never used to be like that. So, but you see, the values now translated into warped national identity. Warped national identity such that what we are now looking for is just to acquire and acquire and acquire. And what, where are you acquiring that? In a third world country like Nigeria, the greatest dispenser of wealth is the government. So everybody rushes to government. Everybody becomes a politician. The best place to be is to be in politics. And once you are in politics, you are not there to serve. 